Okay. <laughs> okay, well, welcome, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Welcome to what is going to be a phenomenally, um, you know, important night. This is a very important night. That's right. So fermentation foundations. We're going to get into the foundations of fermentation. And uh, I think you're going to learn a, a thing or two. You're going to taste a thing or two. Hopefully for those uh, at home, you got a little ferment, be it a beverage, be it something in front of you to enjoy the goodness of the friendly bacteria that we're going to talk about tonight. So uh, this is kind of our lead up to our kind of primer night for the fermentation festival. Denis and I have been running this. Uh, this is our fifth one now. And uh, but tonight is a kind of a standalone. So whether you join us for the festival or not, we like to kind of like just lay the foundations, lay a primer leading up to that event, uh, because, yeah, as we'll talk about the field of fermentation is so diverse, so vast. Oh, those are yours. Oh, OK. I was wondering what those were. <laughs> oh, good. They're right here. So we'll be sampling Ghana's ferments. Thank you for. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, so tonight's presentation really is... You take them. It's all good. This is really a... No, it's all good. Well, it's, it's sort of the introduction for the 5th Annual Calgary Fermentation Festival, which is starting on Monday. But Malcolm and I thought we would kind of open up the festivities tonight. And with actually an in-depth discussion of what are the foundations of fermented foods for human nutrition? So tonight you're gonna to learn all about the important role these fermented foods play in our everyday life and our diet every day. That's right. So ferments are one of the four food groups, four food groups. Uh, if you've been to one of my classes before, I like to teach the four food groups, not the ones you learned in school though. That's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> right how how well has the canada food guide and this kind of thing served us it has failed us really um and yet there is such a simple uh, food guide available to us if we look around the world throughout time throughout history in fact humans have consumed uh four food groups and uh, you can think of these as as the kingdoms of life and very simple, very easy. And the one that we're really going to dive into, in fact, there's actually a little bit of a of two, kind of a crossover tonight. So without going too much into depth, but just to kind of set this up, we have plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi. I know that's super light for those uh, at home, even for those of you guys sitting here, I need a better pen. But very simple, plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi. Those are the four food groups. If you can think of any other food that you or your ancestors have consumed outside of that food grouping, and not as what my author Michael Pollan would say, edible food-like substances. <laughs> there are plenty of those and they're downfall of our society. Uh, is that really food? It's food-like. Uh, but we're gonna explore this kind of underworld, the world of bacteria and the world of fungi. I can think of one, Malcolm. Okay, what's that? Salt. Salt. Ah, okay. Minerals. Oh, you're such a smarty. Such oh, a smarty. Yeah. Okay. Be part of the, the... Yeah. So, in fact, there are five food groups. So, <laughs> that fifth food group, you know, it's the fifth sacred thing, right? Is, is the, in fact, the elements. So, earth, air, fire, water, those are the elements of which salt would uh, come under that that grouping of of earth absolutely you know soil soil based bacteria so really tonight we're going to go on an exploration of like why did humans start to ferment things and really when we start to look at the origins of fermentation we look when you're looking at the origins of fermentation you're actually looking beyond the origins of human civilization Fermentation occurs spontaneously in nature. If you want to have fun, you can look up the elephants getting drunk on fruits. <laughs> or birds and their migration as they come back, right? Yeah. yeah. So Human. fermentation is part of it's a part life of on Earth. That's right. It happens and spontaneously. And humans are not the only species that utilize uh, ferments as, as a source of, of food or a way to prepare their food. But we sort of started asking our questions 
to ourselves. The eloquence, like, why did we start fermenting as a civilization? And well, what did we discover was the most important reason, Malcolm? Well, uh -huh. we have our theory. Yes. Okay. So, number one most important reason, you know, why humans potentially started to ferment, but most importantly to us in this modern day, I don't know if you're like me, but maybe you have people in your life that you, I, obviously you're here because you have an interest in, you know, health and eating well and, but surprise to us, not everybody thinks that way. Now, do they? Do you have someone in your life? It's like healthy? No, not interested, right? <laughs> Okay, so here is the number one reason uh, to consume fermented foods that you can even get them into the fold. We'll talk about the health benefits, all that, but there's one very key important reason that you'll be, even be able to get the most kind of staunch, you know, objector to enjoy and consume their ferments. Does anybody know what that is? The taste, the flavor. Absolutely. Yeah, wine was a good guess though. I, I, I did hear that <laughs> called out, it's true. Um, and when we, when we're talking about ferments, I mean, there is such a diversity and there's so much that we consume every day that we maybe don't even think is fermented. Coffee is a fermented, goes through a process of fermentation. Chocolate goes through a process of fermentation. Of course, all the great alcoholic beverages like beer and wine and cider and meads, all fermented, uh, cheeses on and on and on and on. And it's, and what? Vanilla, that's right. Yes. Another one. Yeah, it goes through a curing process. What do we have here, hey, Malcolm? This once was a beautiful, fresh cucumber. Uh huh. But why didn't I eat it like that? <laughs> why didn't I eat it just as a beautiful cuke? I mean, sure, certainly I did eat a lot of fresh. Yeah. Little baby cukes are amazing. Mm -hmm. But you did it to enhance the flavor. The magic of fermentation. We transform this into cucumber to pickle. The pickle. Mmm, good crunch. Mm. <laughs> now, does anybody know mm. what is the primary flavor of ferments? Sour. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, mm. I would say the vast majority of ferments uh, have a sour flavor. Though absolutely, uh, you can get alkaline ferments, you know, certain cheeses, uh, even uh, tempeh would have more of an alkaline. Natto is another one that has an alkaline for, uh, flavor to it, but most is sour. So it's a good question, Malcolm. Hey, like, do we crave these flavors because we depend mm. on these foods for survival? for so many millennia and millennia. Something that our ancestors ate. Like, did we evolve to crave these flavors? Or, you know, are we searching for these flavors in the world around us for a specific function? Right. And this is, this is one of the most fascinating things when you get into Chinese herbal medicine, Ayurvedic herbal medicine, the importance of the flavors. Each flavor is tremendously healing to the human body. You know, we've got sweet, bitter. I, I think most of us obviously are drawn to the sweet, pungent. myself included. And fascinatingly, the flavor sour is tremendously medicinal. So let me just read to you from the yoga of herbs. So this is a description of the taste from the Chirak Samhita. So this text is literally, you know, 3000 years old. So the sweet taste is nourishing. Oh, I'm reading about sweet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's oh, my influence. It's sour. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, actually, here's, here's a little known tidbit is that, uh, you know, like myself, we've all been raised in a culture that favors sweet. I mean, children, we just love it. There's something about that kind of nurturing hug that we get, oh, a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of sugar coma that we get into uh, and we'll predominantly seek that out growing up. I mean, 
heck, I, I, I still do it, you know, like even though I've learned to expand my palate, uh, still working on bitter, you know, appreciating that. And uh, Denise is going to talk about all these flavors, but they have shown that the earlier you can expose children to different flavors, the less they'll have that craving for sweet and more of an acceptance and in particular sour. And that's one of the benefits of introducing the sour flavor uh, to ourselves and children uh, as early as possible. Okay. You're going to talk about sour. Yeah. And the sweet and sour go so well together. Too. That's right. It's very interesting. But yeah. The sour taste improves the taste of food. So when we're looking at these fermented foods, in many cases, they're condiments, eh, Malcolm? Yeah. Like the pickle is not going to be the, the meal. substantial part of your, your meal, right? That's the, uh, the pickle is a condiment. Yeah. The sour taste improves the taste of food, enkindles the digestive fire. So the sour flavor actually gets your digestive fire uh, going, which is it's one of the main reasons why I think we have these sour foods. It invigorates. It awakens the mind. It gives firmness, firmness to the senses. I don't know who tastes that pickle, but does that, do you feel more awake now that you had that little pickle? And your mouth is just like salivating, right? It's not, it's yeah. heightened. So the sour flavor dispels intestinal gas and flatus. Oh, no, hopefully not immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gives contentment to the heart, promotes salivation. So the more you salivate, the more you can digest your food. It aids swallowing. It, moist, it aids moistening and digestion of food. It gives nourishment. It is light, hot, and wet. But as you can see, what would a, what would a meal be without this sour flavor? You know, and we're talking about salivating. Yeah, which is the start of digestion. Uh, primarily in our mouth, we produce enzymes like amylase, which helps break down uh, carbohydrates. And then, of course, that's also preparing the hydrochloric acid in our stomach. Another stage in the digestion. Yeah, so, I mean, we can look everywhere we look, though, we can find the sour flavor in the traditional foods. Where would uh, we be without mustard? You know, where would we be without salad dressings? <laughs> you know, so we can't escape the presence of fermented foods literally in every aspect of our life and diet. Yeah. So what's happening? Some of these uh, bacteria that we're going to talk about in a moment is you've heard maybe some of these uh, familiar names or groups of uh bacteria. So we got lactobacillus acidophilus. I don't know if I've spelt that right, but if we look at, you know, acid phylos, acid loving. And so these lactobacillus organisms, one of their byproducts of uh, fermentation, you know, consuming uh, foods, transforming that pickle is they create a byproduct of lactic acid. Now, this is very different than the lactic acid that we know that builds up in our muscles after workout. It's a different form of lactic acid. Uh, it's different than lactic acid, which is used in labs as a preservative. Uh, this is its own type of lactic acid that is unique as a byproduct that these lactobacillus organisms uh, create. Yeah. And one of the most important things with pickles, uh, when you look across cultures, if we look for, at Japan, for example, they serve these pickles on the side of their meal, and you have a little pickle whenever your mouth gets tired of the taste of your food. Mm. So whenever you're eating your food and you can't taste it anymore, like the you got used to the flavor of it. That's when you have a little pickle. Cleanses your palate. 
then you can taste your food all over again. It's, it's really the flavor of foods that are, is nourishing to our body. So the more we can taste our foods, the more it's going to nourish us as far as the principles go uh, with these, the five flavors. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, the sour flavor, it does lots of things for the body, lots of things for the body, but it's very tightening, tonifying. We're not allowed to use the word tonic anymore <laughs> yeah, without getting in trouble, but it's I'd true. Say pickles are a tonic, aren't they, Malcolm? For sure. To the body. Yeah. So the next flavor we got to talk about, when we're talking about these pickles. We got to talk about salty. So. <laughs> yeah. And so when you're talking about how uh, sour is used to refresh the palate, I mean, that's something very rarely a lot of people in our modern world experience because foods are so heavily flavored, aren't they? And, you know, kind of artificially enhanced things like MSG, uh, you know, literally excitotoxins to keep us, you know, kind of on, on the edge of our palate, craving more and when you make that reference to the Japanese culture, this is more about natural flavors. Yeah. When we're talking about salt too, and it's very interesting when we look at Japanese culture, the Japanese diet has one of the most elevated sodium contents of any diet on the planet Earth. And yet they have very low heart disease. So when we look at the Western culture, they blame a lot of, heart disease on sodium intake in our Western civilization here. The thing is, uh, the Japanese are, are eating more salt than we are by far, and yet they don't have these heart conditions. So there's two, there's two main theories going on there. One is that the form of salt that they're ingesting is different. They're not sprinkling table salt on their food. They're not sprinkling crystal minerals on their food, but they're ingesting the salt in a living form, in the living fermentation. The, the salt in the fermentation is transformed to a living liquid brine. And it's naturally sourced, you know, either from rocks or the ocean versus chemically, you know, synthesized sodium chloride with a bit of iodine thrown in. And the other thing we have to ask ourselves, is the salt the culprit? Is salt the culprit? And when we look at the diets of uh, the traditional American diet, we're definitely looking at seed oils and these wild things, say Malcolm. Yeah. The salt is not the culprit. It's very fascinating. Yeah, when we look at the taste salty, we're looking at this, the flavor salty is actually very good for the human body as well. So salty taste promotes digestion, is moistening. It also enkindles the digestive fire. It is cutting, biting, sharp fluid. It works as a deobstruent. So salty flavor can actually produce movement. For when we eat, we also must, what goes in must come out eventually, right? So salty taste alleviates vata, which is having elevated vata is when you're very frenetic, full of energy bouncing this way and that way. It actually alleviates having too much of that. It relieves stiffness, contractions, softens accumulations. It also promotes salivation, cleanses the vessels, softens all the organs of the body and gives taste to food. That's right. So truly when we're looking at these fermented foods and we see that they're salty, that's one of the reasons why we're adding them to our food. Yeah. What, how sad it is to not have salt on your food. <laughs> right. And so valued that it was uh, the salary, right? It was a form of payment. 
Now, we've had some great comments come in online as well. Uh, so, A. Mitchell says, sweet, they think, is such a big part of our palates because most sweet things are or were not poisonous, right? It was an indication of like, ah, this is safe uh, as a food. It was delicious. It was inviting. Um, and then, okay, Monica asks, are pickles and ferments different? And she puts, are pickles, aren't pickles dead and ferments alive? You want to take that question? Yeah, I mean, what we have here, this is pickles. These are pickles. Yeah, so this is the lacto-fermented pickles, meaning it's using these lactic acid-producing bacteria like lactobacillus. So literally, it's vegetables in salt water and through the act of fermentation, it acidifies and creates that sour flavor. It pickles the vegetables, anything you put in there uh, versus, you know, vinegar pickling. So yeah. taking vegetables, putting them in vinegar and then heat canning it. So very different. But even, even there, we can't escape fermentation because how do you get how vinegar? You, right. Well, it's a product of fermentation as well. That's right. And instead of using lactic acid bacteria, it's using acetic acid producing bacteria. It's, and it's, it's just, a very big topic of conversation. Totally. Because, our, you know, vinegar pickles, are they good for you? Of course. Of course they are too. Yeah. Everything we talked about in terms of that flavor sour is, is still there. Those benefits, the thing that you're not getting in a canned vinegar pickle or even a canned lacto-fermented pickle that's been pasteurized is you're not getting that living bacteria. Mm. So there's a third really important flavor when we're talking about fermentation. Hey, Malcolm. That's right. And this is the famous and fabulous umami flavor. <laughs> umami. Yeah. What is umami flavor? Well, well, in one word, bacon is umami. <laughs> and for the vegetarians, it's nutritional yeast. <laughs> Uh, or miso, as we're going to taste right now. Yeah. So umami could be des best described as, as savory, perhaps, is a good translation. There's a, there's a deep element of savory quality. And this, we're passing around some miso to taste here, but this is chickpea miso. So miso is, um, it's actually very interestingly transformed well, it's koji. Right, yeah, Malcolm? that's right. So koji is very different than any of the other ferments. Yeah. So what happens, uh, we're going to have, as part of the Ferment Fest coming up next week, I believe she's on Tuesday, the night you're going to miss, Donna. I know. Uh, we're having a, an expert from uh, Lethbridge uh, who runs a business working with koji. And the particular, uh, it is a... It's type of mold, isn't it? The, Aspergillus. Yeah, absolutely. Aspergillus orizae. Uh, what it does? It's gluten free. Yeah. Yes. It's chickpeas, brown and rice, rice, and then this culture, the Aspergillus orizae, which basically starts to enzymatically break down the rice into simple carbohydrates, and then that kickstarts and allows the fermentation process to happen. Now, misos are very interesting in that, you know, some of these ferments can be made very quickly at home within a few days. Uh, some ferments are actually only 24 hours or just a few hours, whereas this one uh, is a much longer period of fermentation. So misos can be notorious to be, you know, six months, one year, three years, even five years. And this miso, it will literally last forever. Now, I had uh, somebody come to a workshop a uh, number of years ago, and he was originally from Germany, and uh, just, he had uh, come over, moved to BC with a group of others from Germany to you know, kind of create a little commune, like back in the 70s. And uh, the commune ran for a couple of years, and he was, he was in charge of the kitchen at that time, like ordering all the food and organizing, you know, stock in the pantry, communal meals, that kind of thing. And they ordered one of these giant tubs of miso. And uh, I think they went through a couple of them. But at the time that the community disbanded, uh, they were still maybe about kind of halfway through the tub of miso. And as they were distributing, everything's going their separate ways. 
he got the tub of miso. He told me he still had some of it in his fridge. It was like this keepsake that he kept in the back, you know, to remind him of those days and those times. And, uh, you know, he was slowly working his way through it, but he had this little jar left over uh, from those days and it was still perfectly good. The, apparently in Japan, if you are honored as a guest, they're going to bring out their oldest miso for you. That's right. It's kind of like the scotch, you know, it's, it's at the 15 year, the 20 year. <laughs> And uh, one of our mutual mentors and friends, Dr. Terry Willard, he used to say, you know, back in kind of the 80s, like you know, he's been in the health movement for several decades and he would travel uh, to Asia a lot, as well as uh, frequent homes of, of people that would have him as his guest. And, uh, you know, he said back in those days, it was definitely not uncommon to see, you know, five year, 10 year old misos, where now it's pretty hard to come across that. Yeah. yeah. This, the one we've got here, this chickpea one is actually quite aged it gets darker and darker as it goes yeah this liquid is actually the tamari and that's very prized so when you see that dark brown liquid you know you have a really good miso but how's everyone's taste buds doing there we've gone, are you noticing <laughs> we've gone for a ride we've gone to... are you noticing a salivation mm -hmm. very interesting so you so for sure there's the salty again uh, we'll talk a little bit about the role that play salt plays in fermentation, but Denise going to share about umami, this magical flavor called umami. So the umami flavor, it's, you know, held in great reverence. And the multifaceted umami flavor enhances the other flavor siblings. It can boost salty and sweet, as well as subdue bitter and sour. But as a fifth taste, it also elevates food, providing richness and complexity while increasing satisfaction. Coating the tongue, it helps flavors linger. So the umami flavor, one, one of the things it does is produce satisfaction. After one, when you have a meal that's very rich in umami. Yeah. And it's the one that uh, people try and cheat with, with MSG. That's the flavor they're trying to bring in. Yeah. Syn synthetically. Very mysterious. Yeah. Very mysterious. So for the Ferment Fest this year, we are bringing this beautiful lady from Lethbridge that started a Koji company. Yeah. Big Life Koji. So that's going to be on the Tuesday night on the Ferment Fest. We have someone that's... Well, I think she's going to teach us some interesting things about this food mold. Yeah. So we've got a several books here in the shop. Um, you know, fermentation, like I mentioned, it's so diverse. It's so vast. And uh, Koji, for a lot of people, myself and Denis included, is an area, a realm that it's still fairly untapped, you know, in, in our day to day. Like, I, how long have you been fermenting for? Well, over a decade now. Over a decade. Over a decade. Yeah. I think I'm almost two decades myself and, you know, Koji is something I just haven't yet really truly deeply explored. So say more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've never made miso, but I've used miso in a lot of dish. I mean, so I've used, I've made a couple of misos now, uh, three different misos, but koji can be used in so many other ways. Uh, and a lot of chefs are actually um, kind of the, you know, cutting edge in restaurants is they're actually using this koji to tenderize meats as well. Um, it is what transforms rice into sake as well. That's right. To make alcohol from rice, you need the koji. It, it actually eats the starches. And transform them into sugar. Yeah. And absolutely, right. it's what makes soy sauce, which is mm, so, so good. Do we have any yeah. Nama show you around, Malcolm? We do. Should we bust some out for a sample? Oh, wow. Well, it's just the, it's just the, the liquid from miso really is its origins. Yeah. But delicious. But as we go, I guess we kind of got to move on a little bit, Malcolm, as we try to explore why did humans start to ferment? So you all have a good idea of fermentation produces flavors, right? You've got that in your, you've got these flavors going on. 
you can see that they are providing very important roles in digestion and health. Our life uh, without these flavors is pretty bland, eh, Mel? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But really, when we start to look at fermentation, we start to see real practical applications. Why did we start fermenting? It might not have been the quest for flavor. I think it was just pure survival, <laughs> right? Yeah. So there's a basic function uh, to fermentation. So which is number two, we're kind of going through these different F's of fermentation. So flavor number one, that's how you bring everybody in. Oh, try this. This is so good. It's so tasty. We're all seeking these amazing, incredible flavors that fermentation provides. But there's also a functional aspect. And, and I get it, you know, in our, our modern day with, uh, you know, supply lines uh, of food, literally, 365 days a year, 24 seven, you can, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing miracle, right? We can access literally any type of food we want any time of day uh, from anywhere. And yet relying on that is a little dangerous, I would say. And <laughs> I think it's gotten us into trouble where we have moved away uh, from fermentation, you know, with that, that function to it. And it's, it's not necessarily part of our evolution, Malcolm, to be able to eat right. whatever, what all these fresh things from so far away. Yeah. When we look at our landscape, where we are here in Calgary, well, our European ancestors wouldn't have survived the winter without fermentation, right? No. And Every single person's grandma who lived here had a big crock. Every single person's grandma had a big garden. They were growing cabbages. There was no supermarket. No. Really, back then, there was no restaurants, really, back then. Mm -hmm. The first Europeans in Alberta survived thanks to their big crock of cabbage. Yeah, and even those... Pickles that would do the, the sea voyages, the treks, right? Like the, the British were known to be prone to scurvy and hence they went to limes and were described as the limeys. Uh, but it was also, you know, Captain Cook and his sauerkraut aboard that provided that vitamin C. So there was, there was a function there. Fought off the scurvy, but also, yeah, this is preserved for a long time. And actually we have something here to share with you guys in the audience. And it's, <laughs> it is a sign of our great esteem for you. So yeah. One of the oldest ferments. And, and this might be getting retired after tonight because I, for the last five years, I've been bringing it out to all these different uh, classes. So yeah, it's about five years old. And uh, eaten it all. yeah, we, it started with two jars and we're down to the, the very last bit of this one here so this was a garden kimchi that uh i mean i call it a kimchi it's not technically a kimchi but uh it was a result of me being given the instructions to plant out kind of some late summer greens my wife gave me packets of seeds and said yes let's let's go plant some greens in the garden here you are and i planted them all and lo and behold I'm suddenly in trouble three weeks later because everything that's coming up out of the ground is all mustard greens. I says, well, you gave me the seeds. I just put them in the ground. So I don't know if it was mislabeled or if it really was my fault. And I guess I planted mustard seeds. So we have this whole bed of mustard seeds or mustard greens, rather. We let them grow. They got big. And uh, when Denise and I harvested it, like just a massive bowl of mustard greens, which is not a delicious green. <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> right it's strong it's bitter it's spicy it's tough tough it's very fibrous yeah so so what do you do what do you do with that many greens uh well and this is the other real function of fermented foods making foods that otherwise would not be digestible digestible <laughs> the fermentation process is in effect a way of cooking your vegetables yeah which is a way a method of transformation uh i don't know how many of you have seen michael pollan's documentary cooked oh that's great the it is fantastic the and book, the book's even better but oh yeah. as always the 
it's all about transformation of food and yeah what makes us truly human all right so this is a strong one transformation you, you you definitely still get a taste of the the mustard but i added the only thing i added was uh the mustard green salt some chili flakes and fresh ginger it is a little funky i must admit but I think it's amazing, Malcolm. <laughs> it's I'm pungent. such a big fan of this. Okay, well, what's the benefit of that flavor, Denis? That, that pungency, that spice. Mm, yeah, we added, it's because you added ginger and chilies, right, Malcolm? Yeah. Yeah, totally. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strong cruciferous vegetable. One of our uh, things that we've done is kind of modern humans is a lot of hybridizing and breeding certain vegetables you know in the cruciferous family especially and maybe lettuce is the best example you know wild lettuce i mean it's so potent you could never sit down and eat a bowl of wild lettuce but how unless you do something to it unless you do something to it yeah but we've selectively breeded bred a lot of that medicine out so this is cruciferous vegetable in all its glory all its potency you know those sulfur compounds and we literally massive bowl of we made it through five years yeah. later but you know we made it through those greens <laughs> yeah yeah it oh is, yeah isn't it? it's yeah. perfectly preserved yeah even though it's five years old so i think that's kind of the main you know function of, of fermentation is that preservation again whether that's uh miso, -old miso. through like beans and grains uh, or things like greens. Oh, yeah, or even the zucchinis from this year's garden. Squash. Yeah. You know? And then, so, these fermented foods are preserved for the future. They're pre-digested. The fermentation is making this so we can eat a lot of it, actually, more than... Yeah, and, and the same principle for cabbage, right? I mean, to, oh, yeah. you wouldn't be able to eat a bowl full of raw. I mean, maybe you could, you know, raw cabbage. It might be a bit of a challenge, but throw some salt on there, break it down, ferment it, and uh, yeah, you'd be surprised. So that, that the salt that uh, fermented the vegetable mix. That's right. Then how do you that? Yeah, really good question. So the initial fermentation process to make it is basically you salt the greens as you would make a sauerkraut you're salting cabbage you kind of hand massage it get that salt in there and there's then... no liquid added to this all the juice came from so it begins the to salt pulling the juices out of the mustard greens yeah and then what you do is you pack it into a jar and there's certain conditions that you want to create uh which is basically anaerobic so without oxygen a certain percentage of salt uh, to favor the good bacteria to grow. And then the acidity begins to build, which is also a way to create a safe ferment. But, you know, this was ready within one to two weeks of making it. Yeah, ready. I mean, one could consume it, you know, sooner, but uh, it was about, you know, one to two weeks at room temperature to ferment. And then it went into cold storage in my fridge and yeah, it stuck around that long. Yeah, cayenne, some chilies, and ginger, along with the salt and the mustard greens. Yeah. You got something very warming to the... Right? Yeah, warming. you feel that. Oh, great question. Yeah, so is that recipe, that's very proprietary? No, no. <laughs> we, actually, we actually did a video of making this together. Hey, it's Malcolm. true. So maybe so I'll, I'll link the video of us. To you guys, how did we make that? Yeah. Because really, uh, it's so easy. But that is the basic recipe. So the basic recipe for pickles, for instance, is a two percent salt water brine and vegetables. Yeah, yeah, and then that's it. You just like let them sit in the water, that salt water, that brine, and then they ferment. And as Denny mentioned, with it, whether it's cabbage or these mustard greens, instead of creating a brine, you massage the salt into the leaves and the vegetables, it draws that water out. So it creates its own brine. And then that is the right environment for the bacteria to thrive, to grow and uh, ferment yeah. our vegetables. Malcolm, that's such an important point. We didn't actually put this on the, 
on the little handout we're going to give out here, but fermentation makes food safe to eat. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Fermentation inhibits the bad bacteria. Did you know that fermented foods, despite popular opinion, are the safest class of foods of anything? Yeah. So there has never been a case of food poisoning, uh, according to FDA or USDA, you know, one of those bodies south of us. Yeah. Um, related to lacto-fermented vegetables. Yeah. And it, it's so funny. There, there was this big lawsuit in New York uh, where the FDA wanted to shut down this little salami this little grandpa Polish guy was making amazing salami for this deli. The FDA came in and was like, we're going to shut you down here. You have to do this, this, this to make your food safe to eat. And the guy was like, I dare you to find any bacteria in my sausages. Well, harmful bacteria. Yeah. Exactly. They'd find lots of bacteria, but it's the good stuff. Right? I dare you to find anything hazardous to human health yeah. in our salami. And they found that this man's salami was safer than any of the... The deli meats the, and all that stuff. Yeah, the, the meat that was made with these, like, uh, all these chemicals. And yeah, well, processed. you mentioned... Uh, Michael Pollan, the book Cooked, which was turned into a documentary. There's also a little section there about uh, a French, I don't, maybe she's not French, but she's a nun who's also a microbiologist. Again, challenged by the authorities. Oh, you her can't. Cheese. Yeah, her she's cheese. cheese. With like wood, which as you know, in a commercial kitchen, I mean, everything here around here from that is all stainless steel, right? Yeah. Because you have to have sanitized surfaces, da, da, da. And here she was, traditional old methods using wood, wasn't cleaning it in between batches. And they're like, yeah, we got to shut you down. She did experiments. She even put E. coli into the beginning of her batch. None at the end. Yeah, power of fermentation. Yeah. That's right. So Donna's got a great point. You know, there are, there are three conditions to create a safe and friendly ferment when it comes to this. Uh, and anaerobic is one of them, which means uh, without oxygen underneath that brine. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I brought this in actually just as a good example. And, and this is still totally fine. But you can see, I don't know if they can on. Um, uh, so these are palm yeast. Peter pickled these peppers. And... Uh, <laughs> There are some peppers sticking up out of the top yes. of the brine. And what has resulted from that air exposure is kind of a, a very unappealing looking uh, whitish yeast or growth that most people looking at it go, oh, it's bad, it's spoiled, we got to throw that out. Uh, I say about this, it's called cam yeast or calm yeast. Uh, keep calm, it's only cam. It's just a surface uh, type mold that very harmless. So, um, yeah, and it's really easy to clear out too. I like to use a little paper towel. Okay, do you guys want to see Denise sweat? Oh, you're gonna try to feed me a chili pepper, Malcolm? It's a hot pepper. Okay, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to split it. Yeah, okay. I'm ready. I'm yeah. ready for it. So, when we talk about, you know, flavor, I suppose it's not so much the flavor, it's associated with flavor. Uh, we're going to get high from this. <laughs> All right, capsicum. Capsicum. Which is a vanilloid. I don't know how hot it is. Oh, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's coming. <laughs> oh, whoa. Woo. Once challenge uh, <laughs> with Malcolm. Okay, Malcolm, tell me about your earliest childhood memories. <laughs> what was the first fermented food you ate as a kid? Was it? It was mustard on your hot dog. Okay, well, I have two stories. The first one is, uh, it was in, I think, it was in grade five, and uh, there was somebody who was in high school that used to like volunteer for the uh, this like after school sports event that I was involved in, and uh, he <laughs> he was really into jalapenos, and he he dared me to like. He's like, if you get a whole jalapeno, I'll buy you a coke, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> I choked it down, but he never bought me the Coke. Oh, no. <laughs> but anyways, I don't know why I bring that up. 
Uh. It's the heat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, the first uh, ferment I ate growing up, does orange cheese count at all? Or Oh, yeah. yeah. Somewhere, cheddar. Cheddar. All cheddar's fermented. Yeah. Um, I've actually been to cheddar. It's, uh, it's in England. You can go to the, the, the cheddar gorges. So in these caves, this is where cheddar comes from. Uh, they, they would age the cheese in these caves in Cheddar Gorge. And uh, it's a bit of a tourist attraction now, but you can go and like inside the cave and see these like massive, like giant Whoa. wheels of cheese that are aging in the cave. It's just the perfect environment, moisture content, everything uh, for them to, to ripen, to age. Mm, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty darn good. <laughs> I could use some cheese right now, eh? Yeah, well, it's such a beautiful thing, the transformation of the transformation of dairy through fermentation is something that's been missing for from all these processed cheeses. Right. Processed cheese is not fermented. And because of that, <laughs> it's not cheese either. Yeah. Well, we touch on another really important function of fermentation is the destruction of nutrients that people might be allergic to. So fermentation destroys lactose. Well, it digests the Breaks lactose. it down. So real fermented cheeses, some of them are lactose free. Lactose, of course, is... Just gonna cool my mouth off yeah. with some, <laughs> some yogurt here. Yeah, so here we see Malcolm's uh, famous yogurt. Is this something... Uh, Find you a spoon. Oh yeah, right here. Here we are. Okay, you know is that. this something we should see if you want to taste? Welcome. Sure. So, tell me a bit about your your yahoo yahoo. You've got this is what you're actually presenting on next week, eh, Malcolm? Yeah. On is it Wednesday night? Uh, I think so. I think so. Yeah, or Thursday. You're I can't gonna remember. teach you about how to ferment yogurt. Yeah, fascinating thing about uh, milk or fermenting milk is you can take one single food and think about all the different things you can ferment it into, oh right? My God. If you just and this is a raw milk uh, yogurt. It's so good. Is there? Is it? Who wants to taste it? Or is there anyone that doesn't want to taste it? Yeah. Well, well <laughs> for sure. It's actually phenomenally good. There you are. So fermentation, uh, like when we would look at the history of dairy, yeah, it so was generally fermented. Well, raw dairy, you know, the idea of like, you know, again, refrigeration has transformed how we've consumed uh, dairy, uh, which led to, you know, pasteurization and all that kind of stuff. But really natural dairy is an incredible food that was usually always cultured or fermented. Um, just leave raw milk as it is at room temperature and it naturally clavers. It, it ferments itself, which is a protective mechanism. Those natural bacteria inside of it just naturally curdle it, uh, clabbered milk. Um, and yet if you add different types of bacteria to it and you put it in different environments, you can get any number of things, right? From sour cream to yogurt to kefir to any number of different types of cheeses, uh, all the result of just one food. So it's the advent of different bacteria, different conditions like temperature uh, that, and time, moisture content that creates all these incredible variations just from one single food. And we can see certain people are really sensitive to to dairy products in, in their but, but industrial it has form to do with the lactose right so when they're eating these processed dairy products the lactose is intact doesn't contain the lactase which is an enzyme kind of endogenous to milk which helps yeah. break that down or the bacteria that would help you digest the milk uh so when this sugar lactose reaches your gut and it's not broken down it becomes food for all your, well, it becomes food for 
<laughs> the bacteria in your intestines. But this causes tremendous amounts of gas, bloating, and farting. And we all know that person that didn't take their lactose pills. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they know they should have. It's... Oh, what's that, sir? There's no carbon tax on uh, farting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so we've had some good comments coming in line. So Amanda says, uh, "Doog or fermented milk is a staple in the Middle East." That's right. I mean, mm, you take that yogurt. Yeah, I think they add a few little spices in there. Cool. Delicious. Uh, so Tatiana, she makes her own cottage cheese and yogurt. Loves it. Rebecca's so jealous. She wants to taste all this. Um, and then she asks, kind of back to our uh, pickles and, and kraut there, are the main reason they mold because of air exposure and lack of liquid? And uh, yeah, so lack of liquid, you know, when I was showcasing these peppers kind of molding on top or that cam yeast developing, the peppers are kind of out open to the air. So they're not yeah. inside that salt acidic brine uh and yeah you can add more and or probably the best thing would just be to hold them down yeah keep them you need one of those in there malcolm yeah that's a little ferment weight a little pickle weight anytime you have these things floating on the surface they become yeah vulnerable that's right I'll, I'll get there that was just cow yeah yeah secret Raw back alleyway uh, milk. <laughs> yeah, non-pasteurized. So it's about here, right? Uh, it it's it's a challenge, but it's out there. Yeah, if anybody's interested, you can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Right. Th that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just repeat it for those at home. Don is mentioning about, you know, the natural bacteria in milk. Uh, they're, they're protective, right? And in naturally protecting the milk from it putrefying, which is what happens when you pasteurize the milk, you leave it out, it putrefies, it's horrible. But those natural bacteria, they protect it and it's delicious. Yeah. It's kind of sad, hey Malcolm, what we traded in exchange for convenience. Basically, and we chose safety. Yeah, we we did we started doing that to the milk to make it stable on the shelf so that and again the, the theory of safety as well, right? Yeah. But ferments are the most it's the most safe uh way to preserve food. So it was definitely a big trade. Yeah, to have the convenience of having that milk there without having to know a neighbor that has a cow or, you know, when we started industrializing, started living all together in these big cities, this is when, why we started doing that. And we're realizing that's what's, that's the big reason a lot of us are not doing so well these days. We don't know where our milk is coming from anymore. Yeah. Oh, but that's why we're here. That's what we're. Yeah, that's what big reason we do this. Okay, so ferment fest. fermentation. We got preservation, pre-digestion, and then we're, another kind of function. Yeah, preservation, pre-digestion, safety, food, food safety. safety. Yeah, fermented foods are amazingly, uh, you know. Yeah safe to eat and it bewilders those health inspectors it's, all, it's always fun to watch them come in fermentation destroys certain anti-nutrients so sourdough bread for example the fermentation process destroys the gluten the dairy the fermentation process destroys the lactose even the sugars fermentation destroys the sucrose so these are all allergens so fermentation makes these foods safe to eat too yeah and then also uh things like phytic acid too in a lot of nuts seeds grains so you look at cultures all around the world yes they absolutely consumed nuts seeds and grains but they would soak sprout uh ferment or roast to be able to help deal with those uh <laughs> anti-nutrients 
Uh, but some another amazing thing that happens with fermentation is actually fermented foods become infinitely more nutritious, not just because they're more digestible, but because the bacteria themselves are multiplying. And when we eat the fermented foods, we're actually ingesting the bacteria themselves. And these bacteria are incredibly nutritious. A pillar of Malcolm's new food groups. <laughs> what, but, well, for example, uh, we have something really cool here uh, at the Light Cellar. It's the non-fortified nutritional yeast. So this is nutritional yeast, and you see it's not like bright yellow, like the other nutritional yeasts. This is actually, uh, most nutritional yeasts out there are fortified with vitamins, with minerals. This, for, this is purely produced, uh, I believe, through the fermentation of molasses, eh, Malcolm? That's right, yeah. But it's, everyone knows how delicious nutritional yeast is, right? Do you guys want to taste this non-fortified one? It's All actually right. so good. Okay. But it's, it, it produces, fermentation produces so many novel compounds. All right. So here's some nutrition facts uh, that Denis kind of printed out. This will come out on your, uh, your handout that we're going to send out afterwards. Uh, and we know nutrition facts, you know, like it's kind of a, it's a low bar. Uh, there's kind of the recommended daily allowance and then there's actually optimal uh, daily allowance. So calcium in, in this particular case, not too huge, you know, 2% iron, 40%, 40% of your iron in the non-fortified nutritional yeast. This is for two tablespoons. If any of you know nutritional yeast, you'll know how easy it is to take <laughs> two tablespoons. It's fantastic. But Add even, it on your salad. Even if you only had one, it's it's still looking pretty good. Yeah, 40% uh, of your daily dose of iron. And this is organic iron. Right. Because it's the non-fortified. Bioavailable. Yeah. The it's not gonna, stuff. Not gonna create a toxicity. Uh, potassium, eight percent. Thiamine, so one hundred and seventy percent. So that's your B one vitamin, as it's known. Yeah. Riboflavin, four percent. Uh, niacin, niacin. B three. Two tablespoons of nutritional yeast, ninety percent of your niacin. Yeah. Which uh, B six. B six. Five hundred and sixty percent of your vitamin B six. Yeah. There you go. Uh, biotin. So really good for hair, skin, nails, that kind of a thing. And eyeballs. And eyeballs. Uh, 50%. 50% of your daily dose of biotin. Pantothenic acid, also known as B5, 700%. 700% of vitamin, vitamin B5. Uh, phosphorus, 15%. Zinc, that's pretty good. 30% of your daily dose of zinc. Yeah, gentlemen. Uh, Selenium, <laughs> 40%. And then molybdenum. 140 percent and obviously there's a lot more but this is just what's yeah. listed and this is just purely kind of a metabolites you know like yeah. byproducts of uh these bacteria feeding on sugar uh producing this umami flavor rich deliciousness with all these incredible nutritional benefits yeah, this is, uh... mm. I actually did a challenge, Shay Malcolm. <laughs> what was your challenge again? Because I wanted to get my daily dose of zinc. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. So I was literally, <laughs> in this case, I would need seven tablespoons of this nutritional yeast powder a day. And I did it. <laughs> and it was incredible. I had so much energy. And eventually, though, I just didn't crave it anymore. It was funny. I, like, got everything i need i was craving it so hard you got got your fill but as we see these fermented foods are incredibly rich in b vitamins really that's yeah that's something that's so important this this b vitamins and i mean it's in human nutrition we don't see them very often so even the protein nothing to sneeze oh, at yeah. here uh eight grams of protein for two tailspins yeah so for a pretty light kind of fluffy part of the meal like Eight grams of protein is pretty decent. There's a reason those kids just go nuts if you put it on popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it's wild. But it makes a delicious macaroni and cheese as well, right? Yeah. But uh, 
All right. I don't want to be controversial, but there was actually a really interesting study done about when you take fermented foods out of people's diets. And this was actually a study in Africa done by the Christian missionaries because it was very sad, but it's the truth everywhere in Africa where the Christian missionaries were setting up missions, the suicide rates were going up. Every single place the Christians were building these missions, the suicide rates were going up. And the Christians themselves were asking themselves, what's going on? They funded this research study. They found that it was because wherever they were setting up these missions, they were prohibiting uh, the intake of traditional fermented alcoholic beverages. Which so probably as culture you go, they have their little beers. And these beers are incredibly rich in these nutrients, and especially these B vitamin nutrients. And probably very low alcohol percentage, like naturally fermented, you know, half a percent, maybe even up to four, five, maybe at the most. But uh... so by prohibiting these alcoholic beverages, they were denying these people the very important source of B vitamins that, as we know, it's associated with depression, not having enough B vitamins. So very fascinating that they discovered that. Yeah. Okay. A couple more questions coming in line. Lives. essential okay so rebecca asked you'd love to find a raw milk source yeah and uh if you're in calgary i'll, I'll let you know uh but i know you're not rebecca so she asked what about fermenting store-bought or pasteurized dairy so yes absolutely Why uh, not? yeah because sometimes even with your nice beautiful raw milk you actually want to heat it and i'll talk about this with yogurt making uh, and so you're actually getting rid of the bacteria that are in that milk or the enzymes that are in that milk. And then you're introducing specific other bacteria that you're going to allow to grow and thrive. And so if the, even if that milk was dead by fermenting it, you're bringing it back to life. So that being said, there's different, uh, types of pasteurization. And so you'd want to avoid, you know, the, what they call the UHT, the ultra high temperature pasteurized. I know in Alberta, you know, Vital Greens is an example of just doing just the bare minimum to get it on the shelf legally. Uh, that's a better choice of milk. It's organic. Um, they don't homogenize. And then they do this kind of low uh, pasteurization process versus, versus the ultra high temperature. Uh, and then you can, as Denise say, revive it, bring it back to life, transform it uh, through fermentation. So that can absolutely work. It'll be uh, alive. This actually brings about one of the really weird controversies in fermented foods is when you go to Europe, uh, they don't eat their sauerkraut raw like that. They actually cook their sauerkraut. They stir fry the sauerkraut. And you would think that that would kill. You would think a lot of the benefits from eating these fermented foods is colonizing your gut with good bacteria, right? The controversy because they are literally killing the bacteria and yet they still have a really strong gut biome. So the, the controversy and the theory is that when you're eating these fermented foods, it's actually creating in your gut the same lactic acid environment in which good bacteria thrive and bad bacteria are suppressed. So by, it's actually the acidity of the food that's creating the environment in your gut where good bacteria can prosper and multiply. Well, the oh, yeah, the, the prebiotics is what they're called when you, when you give your gut flora. It's actually a really fascinating. It's a fascinating world out there. We, I've got one of the most important books I think ever written in the history of humanity, the Gut and Psychology Syndrome book. I'm gonna add the links to this lady's website too. We email you after this, but the Gut and Psychology Syndrome is really one of the, uh, this lady was a neuroscientist 
And she was the one that really started doing work with humans, discovering the link between mental health and the health of the microbiome. And she's been published in all these journals and she has something like 95% success rate with patients that were coming to her with anxiety, attention deficit, depression. 95% success rate is unheard of in the field of psychology. So she really shook it all up. And this, that's why this is one of the most important books ever. And she even had a lot of success with autistic people as well. So her, her website is amazing. The, and uh, it's the gapsdiet.com, gut and psychology syndrome. So we'll be emailing that all out to you guys afterwards as well but she her book is phenomenal to really understand she what she what she realized was that she started looking at all her patients with mental health that were visiting her and realized that every single one of them had digestive problems so she wanted to start and really help she wanted to really help people uh, with their gut health first and see if it would have a on mental problems. And sure enough, she did discover by restoring people's microbiomes, you have a really positive effect on mental health. Uh, it's quite fascinating. It's quite fascinating. Digestive, part of it is stress, right? When we have digestive distress, it is stress on the body. It takes from our resources. If we don't have that stress, if we don't have that inflammation, all of a sudden our body has energy to use for all sorts of other things, right? It's a big, it's one of the big gut and psychology syndrome things. Hey, Malcolm, D distress causes stress. Yeah. Stress takes away from your ability to focus on the moment there goes your memory all of a sudden it's, it's a chain reaction it's yeah a chain reaction that affects every process of the body the fight or flight okay great best non-dairy option to make yogurt yeah i would coconut coconut milk. yeah yeah um yeah it's probably the least expensive in terms of a nut or seed, the most kind of abundant and easily digestible and nice flavor and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I've made really good yogurt with sunflower seeds too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cause they're so white when you blend it up, it looks and smells like yogurt. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, sunflower seeds are pretty good. All right. So, I know my palate needed a bit of a cleanse, so we've got uh, some kombucha. It's like passed around some kombucha, Malcolm. Apple spice. Oh, I've already, I've already drank mine. Popped it. Yeah. <laughs> I, better, I better wet my whistle for this next segment because I've got a point form here. We're gonna send this out to you. Yeah. This is a, a what do they call it when someone looks at all the research? <laughs> it's a summary of all the research. So. Probiotics have been found beneficial for all of these conditions, or at least all of these conditions have been found to be, you know, uh, ameliorated through the use of probiotics. And this is the medical research literature. So all of this has been discovered through, uh, you know, double blind studies. So, Allergies, including food allergies, imagine that. Well, autism, that's a big one. Chronic viral infections. Woo, woo. <laughs> Immunity might begin in the gut, hey, <laughs> Malcolm? It's true. It's yeah. very interesting. Urogenital infections. So I haven't tried it, but. Actually, I heard a little bit about yogurt. Yeah, that can be used. It's true, actually. This reminds me of a story I heard one time. 
that because uh, you know the U.S. Army has they've got bases all around the world, and uh, this one particular one, I think it was uh, somewhere in Oceania, and uh, you know the American men were just kind of notorious for you know visiting the uh, the pleasure houses, shall we call them, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So there was the, brothel. the brothels. Yes, we weren't serving broth in there. I, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and so these researchers were they wanted to study about sexually transmitted diseases and they thought well here would be an ideal location because we've got these these men you know that are kind of they're moving around the world and they're visiting these brothels and you know here's one in this location we should study these women and kind of learn about sexually transmitted diseases it turned out these women had none nothing and it was like what's what's going on what are they doing turns out they were douching with yogurt yeah it's been it's it sounds like it's uh it sounds like uh quite miraculous and and, um, and like not even a yeast infection like yeah, kind of thing right like that's where i've heard it being used for right so there you are yogurt's got many uses <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a fascinating subject. Uh, Keep I, going. So, okay, hepatitis, liver cirrhosis, and biliary diseases can be helped by probiotics. I believe this is because just how probiotics help you digest your food more. It takes the weight off the liver. Well, yeah, good. and like Donna was saying, the action of sour on the liver too could be playing a role yeah. there. Tuberculosis, um, lung thick conditions. Fascinatingly, in Chinese medicine, the lungs are a reflection of the large intestines. So when you're coughing up phlegm from your lungs, that's actually coming out of your intestines, which is very interesting. And a lot of a lot of respiratory conditions can actually be helped by fasting. But yeah, tuberculosis. Meningitis? Is that the kissing disease, Malcolm? <laughs> oh, that's modern. <laughs> Inflammation in the brain kind of thing? Okay. Yeah. I never got meningitis. No. But it could be. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, well, but, uh, yeah. Long okay. story. but malignancy. <laughs> <laughs> malignancy. So we're talking about tumors. Malignant tumors. Uh, probiotics can actually help that. There's a very interesting theory about cancer that cancer is actually a mushroom, a fungus, and it's yeah, it's the fruiting body of a fungus, and it's mycelium is candida yeast. And it's actually eating the undigested food in your gut. So when you give cancer food that you're not digesting properly, that's when the cancer will grow. Because, yeah, it's, it seems to have all diseases start in the gut. But that's a, that's a pretty avant-garde theory about cancer. But I believe it. A fungal organism. It's something natural. It's just teaching us, right? Not the laws of nature are written in uh, in our DNA. Yeah, it help, helpful for arthritis, so inflammatory stuff, diabetes, burns of various degrees. So mm -hmm. even external things by taking probiotics internally can help with the inflammation. Quite fascinating. Intensive care, surgical patients with massive blood loss, probiotics can help them. Clinical infections, autoimmune disorders, when your own immune system is attacking you, probiotic therapy can help that. But that's, this was found on top of all the benefits for the digestive system. So inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, chronic pouchitis. That's when your guts make like a extra pocket full of putrid stuff kind of gross 
oh, <laughs> irritable bowel syndrome and lactose intolerance. We all know people that are suffering from this, right? We all know people that have got this going on right now. It's a big problem. Viral infections of the digestive tract, traveler's diarrhea. You don't want to get that deli belly. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the idea of, uh, you know, traveling. Whenever you go somewhere, like, start to eat the local cuisine, get those ferments in, and get acclimatized, truly get cultured. Yeah, it can help. It really helps. Yeah. We have a question here. Oh, yeah, great. I mean... Yeah. Also, on probiotics in the pill form. Well, everything I'm reading to you right now was studied through pill form probiotics. Uh, However, that being said, you know what's the origin? Where did they, where are they getting these strengths from? Right to put into pill form, they're getting it from fermented foods. They're getting it from human or animal microbiomes, uh, breast milk, soil based bacteria, and I mean, I think we're big believers in ferments because you know, go to the food, right? There sure. are specific in conditions where you, people cannot have fermented things. Uh, that's when you really want to hammer them with the probiotics. Yeah. And that's actually a big, it's going to be one of the big workshops for the ferment fest, eh, Malcolm on Monday night. Yeah. We got the histamine ladies. For sure. Cause I, you know, I, I'd say like take, 99 people out of 100 and literally do nothing else just eat exactly the same that you're eating you know change nothing just add in some form of live cultured fermented food and your health will improve you know in many yeah. different ways but there is that odd person that goes ah i just made it worse and uh there's a lot to explore there but that's that's why we usually like to include uh these gals lucas simmons and tracy reed they uh, have a business called histamine haven and they talk about that exactly uh when ferments you know go wrong for you and what you can do about that how you can kind of get out of that situation so you can get back to consuming fermented foods but i think first and foremost we should always be looking to food uh a it's cheaper number one uh, number two, uh, it's flavorful. You know, there's all these benefits that we've been talking about. And the key is it's ancestral. It's ancestral. It's part of our diet. Yeah. It's part of who we are as humans. It's, it's so empowering. And, you know, someone like Mercole has done studies that, depending on the brand, of course, that, you know, a tablespoon of sauerkraut contains as much bacteria as a whole bottle of probiotic pills, but it's in a, in, it's in a living form. Yeah. There's trillions of bacteria in a tablespoon of real fermented food versus the probiotics where, you know, you can maybe get billions and eight. you have to take like seven or eight caps yeah. to reach that. Uh, well, it's, it can have its time in its place taking probiotic pills. Totally. Uh, you know, I've never really taken, a, I like taking a lot of at once so to see what it does to my body he's into mega dosing i've <laughs> never taken a, a huge coin of probiotics at once i promise you that'll be my index challenge okay let's see what happens to denise <laughs> yeah with eating but denise you have consumed massive amounts of oh, fermented geez, foods in yeah. in a sitting that's true yeah i actually did get my uh microbiome tested once in a naturopath <laughs> i was the first person they had tested Oh, over all the people they have gone through that actually had my microbiome came out as healthy, optimal, the first of many, many people. So I truly credit it to my, every day I have a little pickles with my food, a little sauerkraut on my, you know, yeah. little hot sauce. If Yeah. It's, a, it's easy. I think that's one of the benefits of, of ferments is, is the diversity. Right. Of like, hey, you don't like sauerkraut? Great. Pick something else. You know, try kombucha, try kefir, try this, try that. And, you know, okay, can't do dairy. Let's try, you know, in this version, this form. There's something literally for everybody. So and you're all, you're all seeing the tremendous benefits of fermented foods, right? Something crucial to our diet. And 
the further we've moved away from fermented foods, we're we're seeing so much more illness. But it's something so simple and so easy. Once we start kind of living and eating the way our ancestors did, we see a lot of the modern diseases, the degenerative diseases of modernity, uh, disappear almost overnight. So that's one of the miracles of fermented foods when you start bringing those back into your diet. It's one of the most medicinal things we have in the shop, eh, Malcolm? Yeah. We've got all these herbs here. We have all these things. These, this jar of pickles might have the greatest curative effect. It's, and it's really easy, eh, Malcolm? For sure. That's, it's one of the reasons we're doing the Ferment Fest here and we teach all these workshops here is because we want you to start doing this at home, you know? And when you learn these skills, it's building resilience. For me, at least, when I started doing these fermentation projects, all of a sudden, I had so much to do. Like, okay, you know, what's going to be the next recipe? I've done these pickles. Next week, you know, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, I want to try this. I want to try sourdough crackers. I want to try... You know, I've never made, I've never made cheese out of dairy, you know? You haven't? Oh, okay. I'm not yet. Oh, wait. I did. I did make cheese once out of milk from the go a goat I milked myself. Oh, there you go. I milked my own goat. <laughs> <laughs> then I made kefir. Right. I made yogurt cheese. So I, I made yogurt and then I strained it out and made delicious cheese. Yeah. So I guess I did. Yeah. I mean, that's a whole other art form, isn't it, too? So anyways, the, the field is vast. Yeah, making and... your own vinegar. Making your own yeah. kombucha. Yeah. And I think people, when they get back into the kitchen, that's when you actually find some sort of satisfaction. You know, uh, it's so satisfying making these things in your home for yourself. Yeah. And, you know, to ferment is it's fun and it's free in the sense that you could you know grow the food you could wild harvest the food i mean we're all buying food anyways but to enhance it with all these benefits is really actually at no cost to you uh, especially when we consider where are we going to get these bacteria right most of them are just ubiquitous they're in the air they're in the soil they're on the vegetables they're on the fruits and you're just creating the right conditions uh, to ferment them to kind of make them come alive, thrive, multiply uh, out, of, out of nothing, seemingly. You know, every once in a while, there's the odd ferment, you know, need to buy a culture. We talked a little bit about the koji, the aspergillus. Um, that might be a bit more of a challenge to kind of, you know, harness from a wild culture. Uh, but, you know, humans have been domesticating different bacteria and organisms uh, for centuries and using them in their ferments. Yeah, these are our oldest humanity's best friend perhaps you know we wouldn't be uh, ourselves without these yeah i think it was michael pollan uh, again he wrote numerous books but cooked uh we've mentioned a couple times you know he says people say that dog is man's best friend he says i disagree i think it is saccharomyces cerevisiae this is the <laughs> the yeast yeah. that leavens our bread and ferments our beer i think that is man's best friend <laughs> <laughs> of course one of the one of the benefits Malcolm wanted to add to the this our little handout was we we're talking we we're trying to do alliterations yeah the five fantastic uh, fermentation uh, benefits of fermentation of course he wanted to add get uh, effed up <laughs> as one of the benefits <laughs> we didn't really uh, we didn't put that out we there. didn't go there this time although that's yeah. it deserves its own conversation yeah it's kind of yeah we wouldn't be humans without that but yeah fermentation these skills can actually save your life if it's that you know your pickles are stocked in your fridge you know at home i don't know how many pickles i've got right now i just jarred out 20 liters of pickles so i have pickles for my family and myself but also 
there's another aspect of fermentation that we we kind of want to touch on, and that's that uh, it's glory. <laughs> when you show up at your friend's house and give them a gift of pickles, <laughs> it can win you so so many things. It can win win you and, favors and fame and fortune. Yeah, fame and fortune. <laughs> Yeah, you're you can be the most famous person at the potluck, but <laughs> I've in my experience, yeah, there's it's true the path to a woman's heart sometimes is uh <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely can be true. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. yeah, the mead, the but fermented honey wine. These fermented foods are so popular right now learning these skills uh you know uh it makes you a dynamic person mm-hmm. you've got the pickles you've got the power in your hands <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really uh where we're going here yeah we hope in this hour and a half you really got the point that there's so many benefits to fermentation beyond the flavor beyond just being food preservation, beyond, uh, you know, transforming the foods, you know, fermentation goes beyond uh, the fork. It's everywhere. By embracing it, we really, you know, you know, we're really being humans. Mm -hmm. We're really being part of the culture. Cool. Right on. Well, we wanted to make this kind of just, it's, you know, a standalone, good fun time and learning experience. Uh, and if you're inspired and you want to join us for the Ferment Fest, this is our fifth annual time. We try and bring in new speakers, new topics every year. And uh, our format is going to be from Monday to Friday next week. Uh, in years past, we've done, you know, kind of bigger events, a couple hundred people at uh, the cultural center. And then we went through the online phase and that's great. That's fine. We've got lots of great folks online and uh, we're going to kind of do a little bit of a hybrid. So whether you want to join us in person or online, uh, you're welcome to and uh, learn, learn some new skills and taste some new ferments and that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's starting on Monday. It's kind of, Monday is kind of like the uh, microbiome night. So we have two nutritionists talking about histamines. Why are people allergic to certain foods? Why do certain foods create allergies in people? And especially fermented foods. And it's Luca and Tracy. And we teach us how to restore our microbiome to be able to start eating fermented foods again. Yeah. So, and then we got Jody amazing. Campbell. And Jody Campbell, is a health coach, uh, she's talking about acidity gut acidity and how important that is for building a healthy microbiome. So that's really fascinating. So that's the Monday night. Tuesday night is kind of going to be a fun, uh, we've got the Koji lady. So it's talking right. about transforming with the Koji beans and rice and all these things. It's going to be a tasty one. And then we also have Mike Dorion that night. So he's the living soil solution guy. So he's going to be talking about the microbiome of the soil and how to treat your earth and your dirt like a living thing and how that can really help the health of your garden. So that's going to be the living soils on Tuesday. Wednesday, it's Malcolm teaching yogurt and Derek Fleming teaching about dairy kefir. Yeah. So that's our kind of fun yachtland night. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Thursdays are cheese and crackers night. So we have a, uh, Isaac from the Say Cheese Fromagerie. He's from uh, the Crossroads Market. He's going to be talking about fermented flavors in fromage. So it's going to be like tasting different cheeses, tasting the different flavors that are produced. And then after that, we have the sourdough class Mm -hmm. with our very own chef, Alex Hamilton. Yeah. He's going to be teaching how to do sourdough. We're going to have lots of yummy things to taste. And not only that, but we're going to ancient greens. So we've got all these different ancient grains that we're going to eat and eat with cheese and bread. And I heard there's Concord grape jam, Malcolm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like grape jelly. <laughs> oh, that's a good night. 
And Friday is going to be really fun with, uh, we have Dr. Melina Roberts. She's a naturopath. She's going to be talking about how we get our microbiome from the dirt. Uh, and by, well, from the terroir. Mm -hmm. So she's going to talk about, uh, there's been actually a lot of discoveries recently about how uh, we get a lot of our microbiome from having our hands in the dirt. So that's really cool. Yeah. Is there going to be dirt for people to handle? <laughs> yes. You're gonna, yes. All right. You're going to bring some. Okay. And then uh, that night, I'm actually teaching my class. It's yeah. all about herbalism in fermentation. And we're going to be looking at all the old traditional spices used in all these different recipes. Dill, garlic. Caraway. Caraway seeds, mustard seeds. We're going to be looking at why people use these spices in the fermented food, but also the tremendous health benefits of these different spices. So, yeah. Oh, that's going to be fun. So that's the fermentation festival. For this year. Yeah, starting. Well, starting tonight. Yeah. This is it. We're on. This is it. All right. Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming. Yeah. yeah. Enjoyed having you. Thanks to everybody online. Yeah, and we can take some questions now or a uh, bit, but uh, we got all sorts of cool things to check out here. But I guess that's our hour and a half together. Yeah, yeah. Is there any questions in the audience here? Uh, some here. Oh, yes. So, very good question. Um, the pickles, when you ferment them, do I have to refrigerate them? Or, well, the fascinating thing is, uh, I do, I do. I just keep them in the fridge. But if you look in times past, you can actually can fermented pickles. And that's what a lot of people would have done to make them shelf stable. So yes, you can can <laughs> fermented foods. So it's up to you if you don't have very much room in your fridge, you want to make them shelf stable, absolutely canning. It, it seems like they're still going to have tremendous health benefits, even if you can them. So uh, you could can the vinegar style pickles or the fermented style pickles, but you have to ferment them first before you can them. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, or you. Yeah. 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 What a what a great point to hear. It's uh, yeah. Where did all the cold rooms go? Hey, well, when did refrigeration start? That's a good question. Ah, and yeah, definitely in Korea, people buried their kimchi pots underground. That's true. So, yeah, in in my house, we actually do have a basement uh, with a, a cement floor, and yeah, that's where I keep a lot of my ferments without canning them at all, but. Uh, canning when you, uh, it's like the heating process where you, you get a really hot boiling water and it'll hermetically seal the top of the lid, like sucks it in. Yeah. And then the jar becomes shelf stable or you don't have to refrigerate it. The heat sterilizes it. Yeah, even though it might kill the bacteria, you're still getting the tremendous benefits from uh, the the lactic acid. Okay, we got another question here. Or oh yeah. Yeah, so the question here is about miso. Uh, when you keep it in your fridge, does it 
of of course it's going to slow down the process but i've i've seen miso transform in the fridge over time it'll start out quite light in color and over the years that it's in there it turns darker and darker and more flavorful and more flavorful so putting in the fridge the aging process does continue for sure that's a great question okay let's see if online uh yeah um rebecca is commenting back in the day they used to keep their large vats of sauerkraut pickles outside on the back porch and i imagine that was in the cooler temperatures hey um uh, everyone's saying thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you uh joy is asking do we have any ancient grains here at the shop uh sometimes not really we've got teff we have the ancient grain teff which is not a grain at all but a grass seed that's pretty good stuff Generally, we, you know, the light seller, you know, we try to carry really special things. So you can, you can get really good organic grains and organic flour at places like community. So that's a, you know, we, it's, you know, maybe we should start carrying some flour and grain. I, I bet you would be popular. <sighs> Okay, everyone. Well, thank you for tuning in. We'll let you go. Go forth. Long live the cultures. Oh. <laughs> long live the long live the cultures. Okay, ciao, everyone. We got it going on. Uh, wow, well, only ten minutes over time. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. Yeah. Oh, the ginger bugs are, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they say start with organic ginger. Yeah. And there's a definite time. Oh, did that one just pop? It's okay. It's not. It was never sealed in the first place. The what you really have to be careful with ginger bug is the acidity, because your original fermentation will produce. You know, at, it'll be sweet to a certain point, and then it'll yeah. start to really go vinegarous, and then the the acidity can actually kill and destroy the the culture. So you never want it to go too acidic. If it starts to go to vinegar, you're going to start to lose the viability of the culture. So you've got to really stay on top of it. Don't let it sit seven days. Yeah, check on it. Three days. Taste it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, then, you know, you could just go with a kombucha and then flavor it with ginger. And then you'll get a good ginger ale. Yeah, the, a glorious ginger bug. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it, it will have a certain culture. Yeah. Like, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I have, I have. I have. Oh, yeah. yeah. It worked pretty good. It just, um, it's pretty easy. I want to try like. Yeah, it's yeah, thicker. It's thicker. Yeah. It's thicker. It's it's more like goat, like Greek yogurt kind of style. Yeah. 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 There's various like, cultures. Oh, the coconut yeah. milk. Yeah, you just yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's scary. It was scary. Yeah. I don't have when you Oh, uh, I guess if you see mole.